The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Patty Hunter of Patty's Page, welcome. Today we're going to be covering local, national, and international entertainers. We'll be right back, and I hope you have a great time. And thank you so much for watching my 300 episode celebration this month. I think it's hard to pick just one story that I've thought was the most interesting. Or, you know, because there's so many, that's one thing about WFFT that I really enjoy is as a reporter there, you, like at some stations, you might just cover the political beat or you might just cover the yeah. breaking news or you might just cover more the entertainment side of things. And at WFFT, if you're a reporter there, you get to cover the spectrum, whether, mm. you know, it's someone coming to town that's famous for an interview or whether it's breaking news and you're interviewing a couple that has 50 bullet holes in their house because mm -hmm. they kind of got caught up in something oh. on the southeast side and are innocent southeast bystanders. Side. Um, you kind of you kind of get to cover the whole spectrum, so each day is completely completely different. I have a friend who is on the phone right now. Her name is Lauren Chapin. She was a child actor during the days of Father Knows Best. Lauren, are you there? I am, Patty. Um, good afternoon, good to talk with you. Good to hear your voice, you have a good voice. Thank you very much, you do too. Uh, yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too humble for my own self, but you know. <laughs> well, I see a picture of you, you're looking good. Thank you, mm -hmm. you know, for being 100 years old, not too bad. Well, how long has it been since you've been on Father Knows Best? How many oh years? my gosh, forever. Many years. Uh, I think the last shows we did was 1978. Mm. Oh no, in 1980 was the last show we did. 1980? Yeah, we did a uh, seven hour Father Knows Best Father's Day special. And was, uh, were they all there? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody was there but Mr. Young. It was Miss Wyatt, Eleanor, Billy, and I. Mm. And uh, they, Mr. Young did a telephone call in. Oh, well, he was still around. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So um, I bet you were like a family with them. You can't work with people as many years as we work together and not be a family, of course. When you did know. you first start? How old were you? I have no clue. Oh. <laughs> okay, what I, year? I was a child. Let's say that. I was a very young little child. Well, you did a very good job being an actress on that Thank show. you. Thank you. And really, I had no training. So that was all el natural. Uh, I love the weather, mm -hmm. and it is fascinating. And I love, I'm very competitive. I love the challenge of trying to predict the future and try to understand the weather and try to figure out what's going on with it. So that that's a huge part of it. The other part that I really that really appeals to me is helping people. It's weather yeah. is the one thing in a in a traditional newscast that affects everybody. Right. Some people don't like to watch all the bad news, some people don't like to watch the sports, but everybody is impacted by the weather. So trying to figure out and trying to forecast and then talking about something that matters to everybody and impacts everybody's life every day uh, really appealed to me. I like to try to help people. I like to try to do something that is meaningful yeah. and I feel like... Keep them safe. Yeah, keeping people safe yeah. at, when in, in times of dangerous weather for sure, but even beyond that, even on an everyday basis, it's I feel like I'm providing a, a, a pretty good service. So that, that part appeals to... 
How long did it nature. take you to learn about meteorology then? Um, a long time. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. it was a, basically a second degree, so I went back oh. for three more years. I didn't have to oh. do all the prerequisite stuff uh, right. again because I already had a communications degree. But And you learned on the job as well. Yeah, right? and then that's the biggest thing is once you get into it, you just – you're forced to learn, uh, you know. You have no other choice. Right, you have no other choice. So figuring the weather out on the fly is, uh, is not the easiest thing to do, but it's probably the best thing to do. Have you ever been on TV? Uh, have I been on TV? Oh, yeah. Besides my, this. I, I made my debut with a wonderful man, a young man at the time named Gene Hackman. Oh, it was on Studio oh Studio One. Yes. Yeah. He was he never dreamed he was gonna become this major star, but he did and he's I, I consider him the best actor in the movies. He is very I think good. he's, oh, he's very retired good. from film now. I've seen a movie with him lately, but uh, I, I seem to have a I really leaning like toward it. people like Gene Hackman who came from theater and Carl Malden. I used to make rounds with Leslie Nielsen and Carl Malden and we'd take turns going into all, each office because uh, we were different types. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Leslie, Nelson Leslie Nielsen Canadian. was the first one probably to make a splash on live TV, but playing very serious roles. It wasn't until years later that the comedy element, because he was a comic off the stage, and Carl Malden was one of the nicest people I've ever met. And I was thrilled when he became a major oh, yeah. name on the stage in Streetcar first. All oh, my sons, maybe and then uh, in the movies. Today, my guest will be on a phone-in, and his name is Billy Henshey, and he was with the group many moons ago of Dino, Desi, and Billy. And he starred as well with the Beach Boys. Um, so here we have up on screen Dino, Desi, and Billy. Billy is on the right. Is Billy there? Uh, Billy is here. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Hi. It's good to hear you. Thank you. Well, welcome to my show, Billy. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Did you know that today is the 100th uh, and, uh, birthday for uh, Lucille Ball? I did know that, yes. I did know that. Uh, somebody sent me a link, and I also saw it on the evening news. And everywhere and, else. Uh, <laughs> and everywhere else, yeah. And, uh, no, I think it's absolutely fabulous that uh, she's being honored all over the place uh, for her accomplishments. Have you talked to Desi about that? Uh, no, I haven't. Not, not yet, but we'll probably mention it mm -hmm. at some point. So you're a singer, film producer, guitar teacher. You teach guitar. I do. I teach guitar and piano, and uh, we uh, like to say to kids from 6 to 60. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I got one more yeah. year left. <laughs> okay, well, that's, uh, that's sort of a joke, but I mean, I do, <laughs> I do teach anybody, basically, you know, that would like to learn. I always feel like it's never too late to learn. Or to start, you know. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, yeah. We lived in Manitou, in Indian Village. Is that and, a road uh, or boulevard? Or? Manitou Boulevard, yeah. Mm -hmm. And all the streets in Indian Village are named after Indian tribes or folklore, like Manitou is not a tribe, mm -hmm. but it's a, a... Manitou means what? Pardon? What does Manitou mean? Well, as near as I can explain it, 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 it has a dual meaning of like devil and devil and saint. That might not be exactly accurate, but there's a big lake in Rochester called Lake Manitou, and Indian lore. It basically had a good and bad, yeah. evil good, good uh, side and bad kind side of to uh, it. connotation to it. And yeah. certainly for us, and we knew nothing about that name when we moved there. Why was it named Indian Village? 
Indian Village was named uh, by a uh, African American gentleman here in Fort Wayne, and I knew his name, but I, I forget right at the moment. Uh, I'd done a lot of research, partly because of my mother's uh, illness and right. death, and partly because of my interest in Native Americans. And right. in my research, I came across the uh, uh, kind of an irony that an African American uh, gentleman. And, and I'm sorry, I forget his name, but he came up with the name Indian Village, and based on the fact that this settlement was once founded and populated by Indians who roamed free till uh, who, what, the Europeans what came. What native uh, tribe was it? Miami. Well, Miami was, I think, the dominant tribe in this area. There are a lot of other tribes mm. as well. When I do something for the first time, yeah. I'm petrified. Oh. If I if I can do it again, if, if it doesn't kill me, right. and I get to do it again, right. I'm usually fine with that. But the first, if I do something for the first time, uh, scares you fruitless. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And um, what was your first assignment when you uh, went into TV? Uh oh, I should ask. I uh, no, I, I I showed up for work mm -hmm. at Channel 19 in Lafayette. And uh, I showed up in my, 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 my light blue Plymouth Volari, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I had everything that I owned in the car with me. I had my, my laundry, uh -oh. my stereo. Uh -oh. uh, the, the two most important things that, uh, that a young man can have is your laundry and your stereo. And if you absolutely have to, you can do without the laundry, but you need your stereo. <laughs> and so I walked in and I introduced myself and I, I filled out a little bit of paperwork and they said, um, we need you to go down to Purdue University and you're going to interview an official um, from Purdue University about enrollment at Purdue University. And so they, they handed me a camera. Mm -hmm. And I, I, fortunately, I had worked with this type of camera before. Okay. So I had a fighting chance. Right. I got my camera, got the recorder, got the microphone, some batteries, some tapes. They gave me a reporter, Mary Beth Wenger. I remember her. Oh. They did not have a car for me to drive. Lovely. They did not have a news vehicle. So we got into my car. Once again, remember that everything that I own is in the back seat. And How uh, embarrassing. Yeah, we, we, we kind of got in, and I, I had never, it was the first time I'd met this girl. It was the first time I'd met any of them. And she kind of turned around, and she looked at my back seat, just mm -hmm. loaded with laundry. And she's, you, you, you kind of learn to roll with, with the punches. punches. And so she just kind of laughed and said, laundry, huh? Yep. And we went, and we went to the Bursar's office at Purdue University, and uh, we interviewed uh, someone from the Bursar's office about yeah. enrollment at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what, you know, once again, after you do that, after you have just been thrown to the wolves, <laughs> you find out, oh, the wolves aren't so bad. I can uh, handle Oh, yeah, that. you can handle it. I can do that. You can handle it. Oh, my goodness. Do you sing? Well, I do not pretend to have a great singing voice, and I am certainly not a trained vocalist like Amy Grant, but I sing because I have to sing. Worship songs and hymns provide for me such consolation to my soul when I am feeling overwhelmed by my disability. Songs like, um, all the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me on the living bread. When my weary soul may falter and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Don't pretend to have a great voice, but the hymns are a big comfort. You have a radio show. How long have you been on the air? And what do you normally chat about with your guests? Well, you're right. I serve as the host of the Johnny and Friends radio program. Um, we have been on the air for 33 years. Yikes, that's such a long time. And we are broadcast on over 1,100 outlets across the US. Um, a typical topic for the radio might deal with the goodness of God in the midst of heartache and suffering, or um, how we can trust a God who would allow such awful tragedies to happen? Are these things a result of the devil's doings? 
or are they from the hand of the Lord? These are tough questions that people are wrestling with. And I pray that my wheelchair, well, that it gives me a kind of authority to speak to these issues and more. Because disabilities come at us in all shapes and sizes. And I just want to share words of encouragement, which will help the listener say yes to the Lord Jesus and no to bitterness or resentment. I can tell you maybe about the favorite story I ever wrote yeah. at the New Sentinel. Hi. Uh, yeah. And it's really one of the ones for which we won the Pulitzer back in 19. 83, but this was in 1982 when Fort Wayne had the second worst flood of all time, uh, oh. which most people, uh, if, if you were alive there, then or here anyway, you would remember. Yeah. But, uh, and I know, Terry, you were here, uh, but you know, Ronald Reagan, the president, we knew was coming to town. Uh, and for security reasons, they never tell exactly where he's going to be until the last minute. So the new Sentinel staff, and I think this is in like April of 1982, we all kind of got together and uh, tried to predict where the president would be. There were a few places in town where the flood was the worst. And so by luck, really not because I was smart, I ended up at Sherman Street right across the bridge oh, yeah. from the newspaper. And I got there before anybody else did. And so I thought, well, my bad luck, this isn't where the president is going to be. And I think I'm probably just about ready to leave. Yeah. When uh, pretty soon a bunch of guys in dark glasses and sport coats start <laughs> showing up with little you know, walkie talkies yeah. in their ear and I'm starting to think, okay, this is looking better. And then uh, some local cops start to show up and they start talking to each other. And I can overhear them. I'm just kind of standing around minding my own business. And they start talking about, uh, okay, uh, we're going to bring in kids to pass sandbags. And uh, they started talking to the, to the kids when they got there and told, telling them, okay, you don't have to do anything until the president shows up. And then start you know, acting like you're actually doing something. Mm -hmm. And I was only there to hear that because prior to that, as the media began to get word of where the president was going to be, they started kicking out all the reporters back, you know, to the secure perimeter. Oh wow! And of course, uh, if they'd have asked me if I was a journalist, I would have said yes, I was. But they never asked, and so I didn't <laughs> tell. Right? I didn't yeah. volunteer the information. If you don't ask, you don't. And know. so I was there, the only reporter with an earshot of when basically they were setting up a phony photo op. And so every reporter in the country, and there were m media people from the networks with the president that day, as they always are. Everybody in, in the country reported how Ronald Reagan showed up to help Fort Wayne fight the flood. And I wrote the story about how Ronald Reagan showed up and uh, put on a phony act for the media. When did you start singing and uh, did anyone motivate you? Well, the family lore has it. I was singing in the crib. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and sing Irene, Good Night Irene, or whatever my mother was listening to on the radio during the day, and I'd sing it back to them at 2 a.m. Oh, my. But uh, my dad was singing in a barbershop quartet, and so every Tuesday night they'd come and rehearse around our dining room table, and it was just, you know, I was five years old, and I'd go around and sing everybody's part right along with them. It was just magic to me. Here was this vocal orchestra in my dining room. You know, it was just... Uh, um, just a magic, magical thing. And but I listened to, uh, you know, Streisand, Cleo Lane, Judy Garland, Judy Collins, Joni Mitchell. I mean, it was Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Tor Torme. Mel was my my mentor for for many years. Dearly loved him and had the <clears throat> joy of working with him through the years. Did you know that Tony Martin just recently passed? No, no, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, I had met him years ago too. He was a very nice lad, right, and I yeah. enjoyed his singing. Where did you start your career? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> my ex-husband was a drummer, and one of my first paying jobs, anyway, was that uh, he hired me to sing. Uh, he had a jazz trio and hired me to sing on their breaks. I was singing, playing guitar and singing folk music at uh, a very auspicious beginning at Eddie's Stag Bar on the campus of Kent State University. <laughs> mm -hmm. But my first producer heard me um, at the Ramada Inn in Bedford, Ohio, outside of Cleveland, and uh, at the behest of his barber, just, you know, come hear this young woman singing, and uh, he sent just a, a tape of our show, I guess, around to 
all record companies, everybody turned me down except for 20th Century Records and Records and Russ Regan heard something in my voice and hired me on the spot and said they would look for somebody, gave me a contract and or look for something to sing and the morning after was the first song that he sent and I recorded it actually 40 years ago this uh, wow. October. It's, it's fascinating the degrees uh, of bipolar Yes. Uh, the intensity of, um, and, and the types. We have so much in common, those of us who have this condition. Yes. And yet, it gets very individualized when we're um, up there, when we're manic. Um, and I, I used to, well, I started drinking very heavily. And I, I now know that that was self-medication. Oh. Uh, whatever it was at the time, I became promiscuous. Yes, I, I I would wake up next to somebody I never saw before in my life. Been and there. never again. I have been there then. I've been there. Before yeah. I, before I went. Um, yeah. I can talk about it freely now because, because I know that even though I was certainly doing it, there was a part of me that simply, uh, the, the cylinders weren't firing properly. Right. Uh, now that doesn't excuse the things I did that, mm. that hurt people. Uh, it, but you weren't years, aware of it. It's been about 30 years now. Yeah. In these years since I have done my best um, to, to seek out people whose lives I impacted negatively and to make amends and to demonstrate that that kind of behavior was over. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a constant um, a job yes. because, you know, you don't remember everybody. And so every once in a while somebody pops up and you go, oh my God, I remember what I did to that person. <laughs> It was great because I was able to get a couple of internships before graduating. Oh. I had an internship at WGN in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I also had an internship at WEWS in Cleveland, Ohio. So about two weeks before graduation, all of my classmates are hustling, trying to find employment. I landed a job in Florence, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The pay was oh. ugh, miserable, but it was still a first job yeah, right out was, of college. It, that was your and first pretty, professional? Uh, popular My first professional. Place too, yeah, yeah, great weather. Yeah, yeah. And you went uphill after that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I started, you know, as a one-woman band. I had to carry my own gear. We had ikigami cameras back then. We're talking back in the 80s. We had um, coax cables, you name it. We eventually yeah. graduated to beta cams, but I was out in tobacco fields with a skirt on. Duh. Not a good idea. <laughs> Not a good idea. Were you in high heels, too? No, not the high heels, oh, but, goodness. yeah, thank goodness for that. But, yeah. I mean, <laughs> nobody told me about the grueling South Carolina weather. Oh, oh the heat. Right. right. Oh. And so I'm, I'm in the uh. corn fields and the tobacco fields and the soybean fields. Oh. I, got, I learned a lesson, shall we say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shall it, we say. It isn't like Midwest. No, not at all. It never, gets, never gets really cold. Well, not really, no, it doesn't. Mm. But that was my first professional job at... Um, of all things, Channel 15, oh. uh, WPDE in Florence, Myrtle Beach. I can't leave 15 you apparently right 15. I know. They yeah. love you, man. They and I was there for six and a half years. The Monkees. Yes. When did you get introduced to that bunch? Well, after Tommy and I had uh, some success in New York, I, when after Hurt So Bad, and then we, Tommy and I wrote to come a little bit closer for Jay and the Americans and, and uh, a few other records, some Chubby Checker records and so on. So we got signed then for, for to a, a music publisher who sent us back to the West Coast, and we came out here and started working for Screen Gems Columbia Music, and uh, they sent us over to meet over to the Columbia Pictures studio lot to meet with the producers of this new show that they were proposing, and they explained it to us. It was going to be on American Beatles on television. Oh my goodness! And uh, they needed uh, uh, songs for the pilot and songs they would they re also be releasing the songs on records so we were very excited about that and convinced them that we were their guys and we uh, then we started writing for the monkeys and um, ended up producing their first uh, first couple of albums so you are were quoted as the guys who wrote them <laughs> <laughs> well later on 
after the monkeys phenomena, about 10 years later, my partner Tommy Boyce and I hooked up with two of the monkeys, two of the main singers from the monkeys, uh, Davy Jones and Mickey Dolan. And we toured together for about two years. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was how we built ourselves because we couldn't actually say, we couldn't call ourselves the monkeys, so we just we went out by we, uh, by the name of Dolan, Jones, Boyce, and Hart, the guys who sang them and the guys who wrote them. <laughs> <laughs> and we were the guys who wrote them. Today is a special interview, a phone-in interview w by Tony Dow, who used to be Wally Cleaver on Leave it to Beaver. Oh, it rhymes. Anyway, I remember that show. You remember that. Hi, Tony. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. And my, beside me is my co-host, John Dickmeyer. All right, John, how are you? Hi, Tony. Glad to be talking to you. And uh, like hi, boys. Patty. Hi, how are you? <laughs> so we're going to bug you for about half an hour, eh? Oh, okay. Hey. So it's good that uh, we have you on the line. Um, I've always watched your show in um, repeats, of course. Uh huh. Uh, Leave it to Beaver. Now, that's as, about as far as I know what you have been in until I did some research on you. And boy, have you been busy after you left Leave it to Beaver. Uh, yeah, for quite a while there. And then I started directing. And then uh, <clears throat> I was fairly busy at that for, I don't know, 16 years. And then. Uh, uh, and then I'm into my uh, sculpture phase of my life now. So, <laughs> how, how many years uh, have you been uh, as Wally? Well, we did the first show was six years, so we did 234 episodes, oh. which is qu quite a few. And then we came back in the 80s and did a remake of uh, the show called The New Leave It to Beaver, and we did 105 episodes of those. Wow. It's, it's interesting because the show <clears throat> was originally on in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. and then in the early 70s, there was a movie of the week that we all did that was hugely successful, mm -hmm. and they wanted to turn it into a series, so we then went on cable in a series called The New Leave It to Beaver, and then more recently, it seems like it was four or five years ago now, oh, yeah. uh, Universal made a feature film, so it's it's had a right of... Uh, quite a few incarnations. You know, I'd always done been an artist and uh, done uh, a lot of um, a lot of drawing, and I, I wasn't a particularly good artist in terms of being able to replicate things. But <clears throat> I always had interesting ideas. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog frog in my throat for oh. some reason, and uh, so I was uh, when I was I guess in my somewhere my parents got me a settling torch uh, and I started welding and brazing copper so I, I had in my you know late teens and early 20s mm. I did a lot of stuff and I had always planned that well you know when I retire from directing uh, I will uh, try to be more serious and take up sculpting so when I retired from directing I started spending more time with it so Godspeed, my love, until we meet again. You're always in my heart and every dream. Don't let this time apart give in to all our fears. God will keep us close from up above. So until we meet again. God is with us always. 